What does God think about you and me? Well, he often tells us in his word, and it's not as flattering as what you and I often think about ourselves. Today, we'll look at one way God looked at Israel like a wild, dumb donkey. Not very flattering. Let's find out what God has to say. Welcome to Everyday Truth with Kurt Skelly. We believe the Bible is true and relevant to everyone, everywhere, every day. If today's conversation is a help to you, take a moment to leave a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening. Now, let's join Kurt for today's episode. Welcome back, everybody. Appreciate you joining us today for our episode in Hosea chapter number eight. In fact, we're going to finish the chapter today. Hosea has 14 chapters, and some of them are, are really, really short. So we're not too far from completing this book in the Old Testament. And one of those books that you don't really think about when you think about your Bible, we think more about books like Exodus or Matthew or John or Psalms, but uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And these Old Testament prophets, these minor prophets that are often overlooked, what a great warning. Uh, what a what a merciful God to include these these stories in the Bible for our admonition. When you read the Old Testament, you ought to think uh, of this this keep this in mind that the story of the Old Testament is really just about one third of the Old Testament books. Uh, somewhere between eleven to thirteen of the books of the Old Testament tell the story of the Old Testament. So if you want to just have a timeline, you see the story of the Old Testament in about one third of the books. And so then all the other books, like the prophets and, and the, the wisdom literature and, and those books, they all fit in to those that storyline. And part of understanding your Bible better is to understand where does this fit in? in the storyline of the Bible. So we've been talking about that in the book of Hosea. You know, where does he this fit in? We've talked about the 700s BC, and we've talked about how Assyria is on the rise, and we talked about how down in Judah, Isaiah and Micah are prophesying to people like Hezekiah. And so you can kind of plug this story in to that Bible history by understanding some of that. And, and that helps. To me, it does. It helps to give a framework. I did a little lesson to our church. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you. It's on our website. But uh, I'm trying to remember what that series is called. It's I did like it was an Old Testament survey series. You can look it up and I'll try to put it in the comment section. But I did a lesson at the beginning of that where I was doing an overview of all the Old Testament books. And in that series, I began the series by giving a chronology of the Old Testament. And that would be a helpful thing for you to listen to. It's a one, it's a one sermon thing where I go through the chronology of the Old Testament and I think that would be valuable uh, for you, and I'll try to get that to you. But here we are in Hosea chapter 8, and I'm in verse number 9. We're talking about the impending Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom and how God views what the northern kingdom has done, how God views their disobedience. And I think that's important for us and I think that's what wisdom is, by the way. It's important for us to see ourselves through the lens of the Lord. How does God see me? Sometimes we see ourselves in a skewed way, or we see ourselves in a caricature. And yet God always sees us accurately. And if wisdom is seeing things from God's perspective, then I think it's wisdom for us to see even ourselves from God's perspective. Uh, I've quoted it often here, but it bears repeating. David in Psalm 139, that great psalm about God knows everything about us. 
And in that psalm, David said, search me, O God, and know my heart and try me and know my thoughts. And the point there is David's humility to say, Lord, I don't know everything about me that I need to know. And I don't even entirely understand my motivations and my heart. Uh, I can't entirely figure out all the things I'm thinking and why. So, Lord, would you help me with that? Show me me. That's a great prayer to pray. Lord, show me me. So here in Hosea chapter 8, the Lord is showing Israel kind of the way he looks at her. Look at verse number nine. For they, speaking of Israel, they are gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey alone by himself. Ephraim, another name for Israel, hath hired lovers. And I think that the point of this metaphor is like a wild donkey, rogue donkey, that is going to Assyria, going into a very dangerous place, looking for a mate, you know, looking in heat, you know, looking for, looking for in the rut, we would say as deer hunters, you know, not that I'm a deer hunter, but going after, and deer hunters will tell you this, uh, hunting buck, boy, a buck, when a buck is looking for a mate, it'll make really stupid choices. When, when that, when that, when that male animal is in a place where he's looking for a mate, boy, he'll, he'll go to dangerous places. He'll walk down paths and put himself in situations that he never would have if he wasn't concentrating on finding that mate, obeying his, his sexual tensions. And, and that's what God said about Israel. You're making really dumb decisions, really fleshly decisions, really dangerous decisions, because you're not taking counsel of truth, but you're just following your own desires. And I can tell you this, when you make decisions based upon fleshly desires, you you are putting yourself in a very dangerous situation. Look at verse number 10. Yea, though they have hired among the nations... Now will I gather them, and they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. So speaking about the domination that one day will come from the king of Assyria. So what does God say? God says, you're looking for your help, not from me, but through your political alliances. You're looking for help from this nation or that nation. Judah made the same mistake a hundred years later, when she was alternating between loyalties, uh, between Babylon and, and Egypt. And, and all the while, she should have been looking up. She should have been looking for God's help and showing loyalty to him and repentance and all of that. But here it is. And God says, yeah, you're going to get what you want, but you're not going to want what you got. And you're going to be under the domination of the king of princes because you're seeking help from all the wrong sources. Verse number 11, because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin. So what was one of the ways that Ephraim was trying to seek help? Through worship, but not through worship of God, through false worship. And they were making these altars of sin. And the the idea there is, yeah, they're worshiping Baal, But in the worship of Baal or Ashtaroth or Molech or the gods of that day, built into that worship was sexual gratification and uh, temple prostitution. And and yes, they were worshiping, but they were also getting their desires fulfilled. And so in that sense, they were altars of sin. And it says here that because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be made unto him, the altars shall be unto him to sin. So, yeah, you are giving the overtures of worship, but because you're worshiping false gods and worshiping gods of your own making and honestly worshiping your own sinful pleasures, all it's doing is exacerbating your sinful desires. Verse number 12, I have written to them. Here's what God says. They're, they're, 
doing their own thing. They're worshiping their own way. Uh, they're making their own decisions. They're, they're walking down the wrong path. And here's what God says. He says, I have written to them the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. So God says, it's not like I didn't give them direction. I gave them my law. I gave them my word. I gave them my warnings. I told them all about this in black and white. Here it is. And yet my law was to them like a strange thing, like a foreign thing. They had the word, but it, they looked at it like, what does that mean? And that doesn't make any sense. And that's not relevant to me today. It's kind of like the word of God is to many people today. God has given us his instruction. God has given us his word. But for many people, they look at it like, ah, that doesn't make any sense to me. And can I just say this? If a person has not trusted Jesus Christ as his savior, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 makes it clear that you're not really going to understand the Bible because it is spiritually discerned, spiritually understood. It takes the help of the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit of God. Look at verse number 13 quickly. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it, but the Lord accepteth, it, accepteth them not. Now will he remember the, their iniquity and visit their sins they shall return to Egypt. What a horrible thing for them to consider. It's, it's almost as if God says, okay, well, even your attempts to worship me and to honor uh, the sacrificial system of the book of Leviticus is doing you no good because you're not doing it out of a heart of sincerity. Uh, you're just going through the ritual. And so I'm not accepting your offerings, even the ones that ostensibly look like they're good offerings. They're not idolatrous. They're not to bail your offering to me. I'm not accepting them. Why? Because you're not offering it from a pure heart. I, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. I'm looking for a loyal love. I'm not looking for outside external observance without that loyal love. It's, a, it's like you're going right back to Egypt. It's like you have to learn this lesson right over again because you're just not serving me from the heart. Look at verse number 14. Last verse I'll read, last verse in the chapter. For Israel hath forgotten his maker. What a statement. They forgot their maker. God, I made you. I formed you. I created you. In fact, as believers, we have a, a twofold obligation because we honor our creator as human beings in the, in the natural sense, and we honor our redeemer, the one that has recreated us, that has regenerated us. And so they, for, they have forgotten his maker, and, and Israel has forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. So, they have forgotten about God and they're building temples. They're engaged in religion. They're trying to stave off Assyrian invasion. They know that they need to be religious, but they're not seeking God. And then watch how Judah, the, the, the southern nation, watch how they respond to this rebuke of God. The Bible says, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. So both the northern kingdom, trying to seek favor through the building of temples and false, false worship, and the southern kingdom, trying to build bigger defenses in their cities, they're both failing. Because protection comes from God. And favor comes from God. So false worship and trying to build big muscles and fence cities is not going to cut the mustard. No, what they needed to do, both of them, Northern Kingdom and Southern Kingdom, is to turn to God in sincerity and in truth. And what's interesting is when the Assyrians came down to Judah, they had no trouble taking those fence cities. They took 45 cities and they would have taken Jerusalem, had it not been for Hezekiah finally seeing the truth, 
finally hearing the message of Micah and Isaiah, of finally repenting and God giving them mercy. Different story, different podcast. We're going to quit there right now. Done with chapter eight. We'll jump into a brand new chapter next episode. Hope you join us. God bless you, my friends. Mm -hmm.